Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's a beautiful day here in Providence, and we hope it is for you too, wherever in the world you may be right now. I'm Sasha Pinto, one of the directors of the Ivy Film Festival, and it's our enormous honor to be hosting this conversation with Julius Ona, the brilliant co-writer and director of that stunning psychological thriller, Loose, and our own superstar professor of Africana Studies, Trisha Rose, who also heads up Brown's Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. So we are in for a very special treat, but before we get started, we'd like to take a quick minute to tell everyone a little bit about IFF, which, as I hope you all know by now, is the largest and, of course, the best student-run film festival in the world. Throughout the year, we offer myriad events from advanced screenings of major films, which means that you get to see them before the rest of the world, to discussions with leading film industry professionals like the one we're holding today. But the highlight of IFF's year, of course, is our April Film Festival. And to tell you a little bit more about it, I am delighted to pass the Zoom mic over to one of my fellow directors, Claire Zhang. So Claire, over to you. Thanks, Sasha. Um, our festival week in April includes keynotes, workshops, and advanced screenings, such as last year's Knives Out, At the Heart of Gold, and Portrait of a Lady on Fire, as well as keynote speakers such as Eliza Hitman, Brian Cranston, Valerie Jarrett, and John Chu. And our official selection is, of course, the centerpiece of our festival. So be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook for exciting updates to come. And now we're passing it on to Grace Atanasio and Jessica Dibble to introduce our speakers for today. Good morning, everyone. We are so excited to welcome back director Julius Ona to Ivy Film Festival, who is calling in from Berlin today. Ona is a Nigerian-American filmmaker, and his work has screened at festivals around the world, including Sundance, Berlin, Tribeca, London, Dubai, Los Angeles, and many more. While at NYU's graduate film program, he completed his first feature, The Girl is in Trouble, with executive producer Spike Lee. He recently completed The Cloverfield Paradox, and today we will be discussing his latest film, Loose, which premiered at the 2019 Sun Sundance Film Festival, and if you weren't able to view it yesterday, you can find it on Hulu. Joining Una in this discussion is Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies and Director, Director of the Center for Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University, Trisha Rose. Professor Rose is an internationally respected scholar of African American culture, popular music, social issues, gender, and sexuality. She is revered as an author who pioneered scholarship on hip hop and is most well known for a groundbreaking book on the emergence of hip hop culture, black noise, rap music, and black culture in contemporary America. Professor Rose lectures on a wide range of issues, including race in America, mass media, and gender. As a former student, I am especially excited to hear Professor Rose engage in a meaningful conversation with director Julie Zana about this film, Loose, which addresses the themes of race, microaggressions, identity, power, and privilege that are especially re relevant right now. If anyone has any questions they would like to ask during the discussion, please click on the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to submit here. Thank you both so much for being here virtually and participating this morning. And with, uh, with that, we, um, I'm thrilled and honored to please um, welcome Professor Rose and Julie Zana. Thank you. And fantastic, Jessica. Thank you so much. Welcome, welcome, Julius, to Brown virtually um, via Berlin. How are you doing today? Doing really well. I'm thrilled to be here. I, I had the pleasure of being at the campus uh, for the festival last year, so um, so you uh, know where you're not. <laughs> I know where not exactly, but uh, uh, thrilled to be here virtually. Yeah, well, we're really excited to have you, and um, I'm really very delighted. Want to thank the Ivy Film Festival team for inviting me to uh, be in conversation with you because. Um, there's a lot going on in this film. <laughs> I mean, you know, first let, let me, I thought it was really terrific. And, um, you know, academics are, are grumpy. We always have a lot of critique. That's our job. But I have to say, you know, it was just very rich, very complicated in a good way and still super riveting. You know, usually when films become cerebral and raise the level of issue that you're able to illuminate and leave sort of unresolved, but still um, give enough for you to really chew on, it's usually a little tedious, you know? It's sort of like, you're like, okay, so I learned a lot, but it wasn't very, you know, engaging, but Lord of mercy, was I like, okay, where's he going in the woods and what's going on? And I've got, I was like checking the time, like there's like 10 minutes left. There has to, there's something <laughs> gotta give, you know? So anyway, you know, hats off to you for doing a fantastic job. 
Thank you so much. And again, thanks to everybody from the Ivy Festival. I'm, I'm so excited to be here and to be connecting with you again, Dr. Rose. Um, as, as we discussed a little bit, uh, yeah. seminal moments when I was developing creatively as a theater student at, um, at Wesleyan University was getting to hear you speak. So the moment uh, this was uh, offered to me, I said, hell yeah, I want to, uh, I can't wait to engage and, and, and also just get to hear from you because, you know, part of what was so exciting about making a movie like Loose is hearing people's perspectives and points of views. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm just as thrilled to hear um, from you and, uh, and of course, from all the students. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And I'm, I'm, you know, we did talk about our previous meeting at Wesleyan or sort of indirect meeting at Wesleyan. And I'm going to go, like I said, look into it so I can remember what went on. But, um, yeah, but yeah, the, pictures. <laughs> say it again. I'll see if I can find some pictures, some photos. Yeah, oh, if you've got pictures, or as they say, receipts, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. My email is very easy to, I'll give it to you before we leave so we can stay in touch. Um, that would be very helpful. I need everyone to document my life so I know what the heck happened. But listen, this is, um, I want to, I have so many questions. Let me just start at the, at the kind of low end of the radar because I don't want to get to the, um, meet super fast because then you know we will have nowhere to go and um, but I really want to start with why you wanted to do this film you know there's a lot of films and I mean I know it's based on on a on a, a play is that right um, but it's not the only material there is and you're also a writer and so on and so forth so what was it about the struggle of this narrative that really drew you to it and, and made you want to do it? Um, it's, it was a number of things. Uh, first of all, I was born in Nigeria, and I moved to America when I was ten years old and ah. in Arlington, Virginia. Um, uh, so there were elements of the story that tracked closely to my experience of you know growing up and being black in America, and the questions that I had to grapple with in terms of identity and how one defines their blackness, how one's blackness is defined for them. Um, so, um, at the minute I was done reading the play, I just said, I have to turn this into a movie. Um, and then secondly, it was, you know, the play was first performed in 20, 2012, 2013, and I read it in 2014. And, um, obviously we've had a really massive, uh, sea change in terms of the kind of conversation we've been having around identity in this country, mm -hmm. but at least at the time that I read it. And I think it still holds today. Um, I felt that it was so rare that we were watching or seeing or being exposed to stories about identity and about race and about gender and about sexuality and all the myriad elements of identity that were engaging with them with the kind of frankness that I thought the play was and the kind of faith that it had in an audience to observe things that might make them uncomfortable or disturb them, but trust that they were capable of processing that and not just trying to arrive at their own conclusions, but hopefully um, arriving at some sort of enlightenment or understanding that they might not have had before. So it was it was those two things together that, you know, it just felt undeniable. Right, right. Yeah, though, no, that's that's a lot of, of synergy. Um, but I think, you know, what I, I love your point about trusting the audience to grapple with it in some kind of meaningful way. Um, and, you know, so you don't resolve it. You could have written it or revised it in a way to resolve something or explain something. Um, but did you choose the psychological thriller format for that reason? What, what's the relationship between the, the, the kind of narrative, right, that, you, that you've chosen and the, and the, and the goals of, of, your, of, your, of your work? Um, it was threefold. The DNA of that was already in the play in terms of the way it was withholding information. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that certainly was accentuated in the film adaptation. Um, and the first reason I really loved that as a format was that it felt organic to the way the story needed to be told and also felt very organic to the way we observe some of these issues in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. We stand as bystanders uh, often the case when we see the reality of how race operates or gender or class. And then we bring our preconceptions into that and then render a moral verdict on what we see. So the thriller component of it wasn't just, oh my God, how do we make this the most exciting version of the movie? It was also, how do we structure this and create an involvement for the audience so 
they are rendering a judgment, not just on the characters, but on the story that they're seeing and in the process being implicated and asked to interrogate themselves and why they believe a certain person or how their point of view and their preconceptions and the baggage they bring uh, 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 makes them feel about what they're seeing. So that level of involvement I felt was really critical for a story right. like this, especially because as I said before, I didn't feel like I was seeing stories enough that was respecting the audience with that kind of an intelligence or rather expect respecting the intelligence of the audience in that way. And then lastly, I mean, some of it is also, you know, when you're putting a story out there in the world, you need to have a mode that you can connect with an audience. Um, and I just felt, again, it was rare to see this kind of story told this kind of way. Mm -hmm. On some levels, it's just sort of a suburban American drama about a family and a kid in high school. Mm -hmm. so down the middle way you could have gone with telling it. And I love the idea of trying to subvert that, however successful we were. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, you were successful for sure, because, you know, if this had been, you know, a typical sort of upper middle class white family with a white kid who was sort of looking like he was getting into trouble, it would not be rife with all of this conflict. I mean, it's it's almost, um, you know, as soon as you really look at that piece of the form, right, the, the context, then you realize what work race is doing, um, because it seems so like, well, of course, your, their parents are going to defend him. You know, he's an he's a sort of, you know, sort of upper middle class white male cisgendered athlete. And, you know, if you just play it out that way, the story's entirely different. Um, entirely different, even at the level of what you trust and what you don't trust about what could have happened or not happened. And then not just what could have happened or not happened did, you know, this imaginary white male, right, athlete that I'm constructing, did yeah. he do this or do that? But also, you know, what are the... Um, character consequences of doing it, right? Because, you know, with Luce, we end up wanting him to be, you know, he's either good or bad. You know, he's either, you know, an evil sort of kid who's suppressed and not sharing this extremely um, uh, manipulative, violent sort of way of being, or he's the charming, fantastic, you know, lovable, uh, you know, you know uh, in, included and chosen talented 10th of the of the sort of global black world um and you know that's obviously what you're trying to get at too right it's all or nothing when you're black it's either you're you know evil or you're not but so what i love is the way you're able to this through the form and the presentation to mine the racial unconscious right because it really how do you get at that right i mean that that's a big issue for us you know you tell people directly and then they just erect the story they already have and you like you then you spend the rest of your time trying to poke it um, but you just basically leave all this room for the racial unconscious to fill in. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're like, oh, that's me. <laughs> it's like not the film. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, again, I think that was the brilliance of what JC had constructed with the play. And then the fun and the excitement was in translating it to a film. How does the camera also involve the audience in that way? You know, one of the tricks of the movie was not over directing it. There were so mm. many have been done to sort of jazz it up a little bit more right really aiming for a kind of simplicity and an observational quality in terms of how the camera was used so that you as the audience were uh, a spectator but um, the camera and the filmmaker was never uh, to the point you just mentioned sort of telling you who to believe and what way to go um, right but you're just bringing that personal experience of yours into it and you know everything you say about loose uh, it's, it's it's what resonated with me so much and why I wanted to tell the story so much because that participatory component of it, um, as you said, is what exposes whatever inherent biases and prejudices and ideas that we all have about race right. um, uh, and the ways we might think that uplifting somebody like Luce or, or celebrate him, celebrating him for the symbolic value that he has uh, in some ways absolves us or gives us an alibi from, you know, everything else that we might believe um, uh, on the negative end of the spectrum. Um, right. and, and then, of course, you know, when you see that in relation to somebody like Deshaun and how he is treated in the film, um, um, you know, it, it, it becomes a really interested and complex and hopefully complicated dynamic. But I love what you were saying, though, about the... Um, what if he had been white, right? Because that was one of the big things that we also talked about a lot in that 
there is a version of Luz that is white, right? The proximity he has to whiteness because of his parents affords him some of the privileges in terms of the benefit of the doubt, affords him some of the privileges in terms of what he might be able to get away with, which is something that he's he recognizes and understands um, on some levels. So, you know, that double consciousness that, you know, we've all mm-hmm. talked about so much is, is something that he's constantly struggling with in the story. Um, um, and it just felt um, like this was a great opportunity to, to explore that and in, in, in hopefully in a way that um, offered something to an audience. Right, right. Definitely strong proximity to whiteness. But that also, you know, connects to another kind of complexity about blackness um, mm-hmm. in, in, in the U.S. in particular, which is the hierarchy of um, for many whites about which black people are better than other black people. And, you know, immigrant blacks, starting mostly with the West Indian immigration Mm -hmm. that most of the 20th century allowed in small numbers until 1965, when immigration based on race was, was relaxed. The, the code, they were literally quotas for countries. Um, And then of course, eventually then the global black world becomes part of the American black experience and reality. But there's still pretty pretty significant hierarchy where domestic American blacks are considered, um, you know, a problem, and immigrant blacks are the good black people, and so there's that tension going on too about not just uh, him having proximity to white parents, but also this immigrant status. Was that in the play originally? Because I, I don't know the play. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, how how did that play out, and and why was that important to you? It was in the play, um, but it was something that was a little bit more nondescript. And again, as an immigrant to this country and somebody who has seen how those hypocrisies work and felt um, at certain points the beneficiary of those hypocrisies, Mm -hmm. it was very important for me in this story to start to explore that. Because, you know, what you allude to in terms of the changes in immigration law, everything from, you know, eventually repealing the Chinese Exclusion Act and the burst of immigrants who came in um, who enjoyed the benefits of the civil rights movement, right? Um, But at the same time, were also being used to, uh, as again- Undo another the civil rights movement. <laughs> yeah, and another alibi, another excuse. Well, you know, they came and they, they pulled, they figured it out, right? right? So it, it can't be the history of all the racist and prejudice and, and destructive and harmful policies that this country has participated in when it comes to the descendants of slaves. If these people were able to come in and figure it out, then you know America and the myth of what America tries to sell has to work. Right. Um, um, so it was very interesting for me to try and explore that in Luce, and then also in the dialogue between Luce and Harriet, and to mm-hmm. expose. Oh some yeah, that was a killer. In terms of you know the way he thinks he might be behaving that is just, but then the understanding of the world from her experience that Harriet has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wrote down. Um, you know, America puts you in a box. Only some of us get any light, and that's just the way it is. Who? I mean, you know, I mean that was that was a rough, <laughs> that was a rough moment. And then, of course, that scene is so profoundly shaped by the fact that he still seems quite threatening in that moment. He comes into her house unannounced. I mean, she clearly closed the door on him. And you know, that's an aggressive move. You know, uh, the house is dark. Uh, so it doesn't feel like it's an open, sunny space, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and But then, of course, he also seems genuinely shocked by the graffiti, right? So here we are left with um, three, four, and five layers of, of confusion. Um, but, you know, the other thing is that Harriet, um, you know, the film is ambivalent about her, too, Um Right. It's not just loose and whether or not he has good intentions or is being mislabeled or whatever. It's also Harriet. Right. Because the very expectations that this distorted racial hierarchy and the logics that people have you know, produced to generate and, and normalize it have produced distortions in how to respond. Right. And she seems like she's very invested in. Uh, saving kids by um, demanding that they adopt uh, normative terms 
and repress who they might be in creative and cultural expressive ways, or that they can't afford any of the flaws that every kid normally has. Um, but she seems to take that too far. I mean, let me just say one more thing, and then I would love to hear what you think of this. Yeah. Um, I mean, I ultimately was raised very similarly, like, look, you have to work twice as hard. Like, this is the rule. I remember being 13, around 12 or 13, and being really frustrated because I felt I was being judged unfairly at school in terms of some project or work. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, my dad just sat down, sat me, I'll never forget this because it was like that moment where you're like, oh shit, <laughs> like it's not going to be fun out here. Um, yeah. You know, he basically said, look, you know, you're a woman, you know, you're black, you're going to have to work twice as hard. I can't change that. You know, I can't fix that in your lifetime. You know, I, I just want you to know that you have all that you need to do it. So you're, you're going to be all right, but you have to work twice as hard. So, you know, I, I really, in some sense, felt a, an understanding and a kinship with that model that she was expressing, because I don't think it's untrue. I think it's true. But at the same time, how do you retain the connection to people who say, I want to work the regular amount? I just want right now. That's all I'm going to do. And I expect, and I'm going to, all right, d- instead of judging them, for being somehow lazy in the context of a ridiculous system to really ex- exploit the reality of the system. So what were you thinking about that dynamic in, in, in particular? You know, one of the things that I loved and that JC loved as we were talking about it is what happens when you put two people who have a legitimate perspective up against each other, right? Based mm-hmm. on their experiences of the world and also based on their aspirations of what they would like the world to be where there is not an easy answer to that. And the truth of the matter is, um, and I, I, I'm sort of sensing that it might be similar for you too. I, I, there's a part of me that is loose and there's a part of me that's Harriet, right. right? And that's what was interesting for me that I didn't quite know the answer to that question, but it yeah. then felt like a fertile ground for a drama and a conversation to be had because of what it exposes in terms of the flaws of our system and our culture. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I knew Harriet's. I had the benefit of having people like Harriet's in the world protect me as I was growing up, you know, sometimes in primarily white spaces, sometimes whether professionally or academically. Um, And that pressure that gets put on you, that conversation that you had with your father that I had with my mom too, and my parents, you have to work twice as hard. You have to be perfect. You cannot mess up because if you do, it reinforces every negative stereotype. So on one hand, yes, Harriet is trying to protect him, but at what point is that protection then a reinforcement of the status quo? At what point then, if the whole idea, you know, I thought a lot of Harriet as somebody being a product of the liberal revolution of the 60s, of civil rights, of all these ideals that we've tried to profess since then, right, and live up to since then. Well, at what point do we get to move beyond those ideals and the set of perfection that people need to have um, um, mm-hmm. and actually allow somebody to be human, right? right. Allow you to lose and to shine and not be punished for being either one of them, right? right? right. When, when do you have access to the full spectrum of human humanity that our fictional white kid might have. Um, and, you know, some of those kids end up to become president, no matter how derelict they are. Right. I mean, some of them barely passed college. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, look, look at our last two Republican presidents. Oh my gosh. College, you know, grades were clearly not on their agenda. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so I was very interested in that question of, okay, if there is symbolic power to what loose represents, if the flip side of it is that you have to be perfect and the other side of it is you are just a monster and a delinquent, in both of those cases at a certain point, you're not having access to humanity. Right, right, that's entirely right. And you know, it's it's very frequent that we expose the stereotype threat side, right? Which is the monster side. And we talk a lot about, you know, mass media depicting, you know, Mike Brown in uh, Ferguson as a thug, right? And just allowing a certain kind of narrative to be in play. But we don't explore this other side of the coin, which Luce spends the film discussing and really, you know, chewing on and tussling over, which is, you know, what happens to the consciousness, to the sense of human possibility, what happens to the psyche, 
um, of people who are somehow the antithesis of the stereotype threat or somehow have been able to be protected from it in some way. And, and so, you know, is, is a certain kind of repressed rage part of that identity in your mind or is that just the psychological thriller part of the movie? I, I think, you know, however it ultimately manifests itself, a, a certain confusion that can at times be rage mm-hmm. has to be a part of it. At least that was my experience of it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And there were moments and episodes and different points in my life where I found myself exploding and not fully being able to unpack it mm-hmm. until I started to obviously get a little bit older and hopefully had right. a reservoir of experience to tap into. But, you know, to your point about that flip side of the, the, the perfection, well, also what are the limits of that perfection in the sense of you're never going to stop being black, right? So right. even if you fulfill every set of expectations, at some point, the goalposts will probably be moved and there is a tax put on you emotionally and psychologically and spiritually. And ultimately, if, if, if you have to live on this sort of binary standard of existence, again, even if you fulfill every aspect of what is expected of you. Right. To, yep. to your point about being able to express all these other different aspects of who you are, you know, I, I was very concerned and invested and and still I'm grappling every day with this notion of we have the ideals of what this country is supposed to be and who's supposed to have access to those ideals and how do we fall short of that. Right. Um, uh, day in and day out with the standards that we put in place. Yeah, and, and the way we fall short is not just by not living up to them, but by actively preventing them from happening. And that's part of the goalpost. And that's also part of the, you know, who could be understood as having their whole future ahead of them. You know, that moment when um, the, when Amy, I haven't even got, I have so many questions. Anyway, yeah. um, I just thought of like five going over here that I wasn't even going to. But um, when Amy, after she follows him, you know, after school and then gets home before Luz, um, and uh, she says, you know, you have your whole life in front of you. And he says, I hope so. Um, you know, that, that what, what really resonated with me about that was, you know, the, 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 the context where, you know, parents are really trying, even in that weird way of parenting globally and complexly cross race, you know, they, they, that's all they really want is the idea that their kids have a life in front of them of opportunity and that they'll be able to make something of that. But what really first came to mind was, and this is, I guess, a sign of my own, you know, distorted mind, is <laughs> the, the judge in the case of the Stanford uh, rape trial who said, you know, basically he wasn't going to give them much of a sentence. I can't remember the details right now, but he said, you know, they have their whole lives in front of them. And it was all about the privilege of white masculinity to, right, that was part of that idea that we know they have their whole lives in front of them because we've, you know, written the path, right? We have put down the cobblestones for them. We know exactly where that goes. Whereas no one says that about a black teenager who's been accused of rape. Not, I mean, it just doesn't happen. They don't say, oh, he's got his whole life in front of him. Let's give him a short sentence. It's like, no, we're going to throw the book and everything else at him because it's a pre... So is, was that in that kind of veil? Was that part of the, the intention there to sort of question, does he Absolutely. have his whole life? Could he? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because again, when you think of that proximity to whiteness, right? One of the things I would say to Naomi and Octavia when we were rehearsing that big scene when mm. Naomi comes to school, when Amy comes to school and she right. tells mom, is imagine if this had been Deshaun's mom who came into this space, right? right to have this conversation. Would, would Principal Dan say they're good kids, right? right? Would, would he say they got their whole future ahead of them, right? Right. And um, as much as Amy loves and protects her son, and to your point, right, that moment when she says, you have your whole life ahead of you, and he says, I hope so. Well, his proximity to whiteness, to a certain degree, ends once he walks out that door and he's no longer her little boy who she's raised from 10 to 17. Once he's out there in the world, everything that she's tried to invest in him, right? Yeah, is now questioned. Now questioned, or- you know, be taken away. Right. 
Yeah. Whew. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, um, um, yeah. I mean, I have like 10 questions. Let me see which way to way to go. Let me ask one gender question. Um, because I thought it was really interesting. Um, the scene, um, well, well there's a couple things I thought were interesting. One that Luz had some kinds of relationships with, you know, other black men in the film through his athletic, uh, you know, team context, which I thought was the track model was also really interesting. Like why be a track runner, right? Because there's, you know, that whole image of um, thinking of racial discrimination as being about obstacles when you're running a race, right? And, you know, he's always trying to run as fast as he can. And of course ends with that grimacing run, um, uh, which leaves you wondering what's going on. But but he, there are no black women of, that he, in his age group that he has any relationships with. Um, and yet there's that very pivotal scene leading up to when the parents come for the 6 p.m. session mm -hmm. uh, to talk about what happened. And you see the black girls who are, I guess, kind of like a cheer squad. Yeah. Um, and you see them practicing. But that's kind of the only moment when you see his peers of black women what what were you thinking about that or were they in the play were they not in the play and why 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 was that important because it feels like they should have like naturally been in some kind of conversation with Luce at some point um so that was you know when you're telling a story and finding just moments in life um that was we were shooting at this school and we saw these girls who were uh, performing and it was just I loved it. I just they were fantastic. They were fantastic. I was like, I wanted to find a way to to include that in the film. But then I also was remembering my experience. So again, I grew up in Arlington, Virginia. I went to a school like I mean, in the play, they never specify. Uh, it's never specified where the story is set. It kind of deals with that kind of abstraction that theater often deals in. It's just nondescript suburban mm -hmm. America. So for the movie, I felt it was important to situate it in a context that gave us a grounding and a sense of reality. And of course, there was an autobiographical component of it as well. But going back to my high school experience, um, I was part of the IB program. Mm. Uh, and the space that I operated in was exclusively a white space. Mm. It was me. And I, I remember there were two Asian girls, one Mexican girl, and everybody else was white. Um, so in thinking about how Luce's identity is also being constructed in this world, outside of the few black students he gets to interact with through track, he is partially on this, you know, this incredible symbolic figure because he also lives in this space where right. pretty much everybody else around him um, uh, is a white student, a child of privilege, and he's able to interact with that world in a way that's very specific. And then he code switches when he goes to the other world and the other mm -hmm. space. So right. part of it is kind of trying to create some of the sense of the different spaces that he's moving through in the world. Right. Of his right. Um, that, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah, I was going to say that's also tracking, right? Because that's what that process was about. Who does well on test scores? Who goes to the AP classes? That's just school tracking. So the track metaphor um, continues there really profoundly. Um, and so you just mentioned speaking in code and switching code switching. And there's that moment of the lecture that um, Harriet gives when she talks about the importance of speaking in code, not so much only for happens when... <laughs> You get a professor to watch a movie about race. I'm like, well, you know, like, oh, okay. All right. And you write down all those things. Um, but it was really, it was very well done because it wasn't just about exclusion. It was about bonding people together. Um, and then it's about not only about saying that there's black speech that unites black people, but it's also about saying that Luce knows how to bond with whites. He performs the codes of whiteness and he also performs the codes of, of, of a good child in a, in a predominantly white you know, presumed setting that one of the most chilling moments, I mean, there were a number of psychologically, you know, stressful moments, but the most chilling moment was when he said, I'm good at um, pretending surprise. 
I mean, whoo, that was just, I mean, you know, but, you know, so it raised the question for me, we're all performing anyway. I'm performing right now. You're performing right now. The audience is performing while they're waiting to come in and ask questions. Everybody's performing. So why is that a bad thing? But somehow we want there to be some truth in that performance, right? It's not, you know, a performance doesn't equal a lie, right? But there's something about that moment when he's, performing surprise and you're like so we don't know who this brother is we don't know really where he is and then you then I said to myself well we don't know where anybody is but then I'm like well do we not know where anybody <laughs> so why you know how were you what were you thinking about that that particular scene because that's the same scene with the you have the, your whole future ahead of you um, were you connecting the code switching to the to to the code switching about whiteness as much as it is code switching about blackness? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the conceits of the, from the very beginning from the play is what if somebody on some levels had a superpower that was code switching, right? You have this kid who has this incredible ability to navigate different spaces with this sort of effortless fluency. of, uh, uh, and, and that is part of the power that he has and part of the way he's able to cater to all the people around him. Um, but, you know, I think specifically with Luce, for me, the question was, in America, when you are in the kind of position that he's in as a black person in this country, mm -hmm. the expectation of the performance that you have to put on is always on multiple layers. That is possibly something that allows you to succeed, but also possibly something that crushes you and destroys you. Right, because right. if we think about the kind of performance that a let's talk about your you know uh, hypothetical upper middle class white male student, well, he's operating primarily in spaces where even if he's performing, it's a set of codes and an understanding that is implicit to that space that that space has been built to inhabit uh, for him to inhabit, and um, where some of what we were talking about, the consequences of even if his performance slips in that world are very different, right? Mm -hmm. Than if you are black or if you are a woman or if you are somebody who these spaces are organically built for you to exist in and to negotiate. So I think what I was interested in was the notion of, yeah, we might all be performing, but what happens when that performance right. does not live up to the expectation of, of what people want? Or what happens when even the best version of that performance is not enough? Case in point, you can graduate with your gentleman C's and et cetera, et cetera, and still be able to ascend to the highest office. Uh, 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 and, you know, again, we see that in the test taking. We see that in, in how job placement works. We see that in every facet of how life is organized exactly. in terms of who's kept out and who's kept in and who's expected to have uh, perhaps a more successful version of the performance. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it therein lies a lot of this uh, intermittent rage. Let, let's think of it that way, right? Because it's not a, a constant state of, 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 of anger, but it's very hard to participate and to see, you know, uh, privileged mediocrity <laughs> when mm -hmm. you're killing yourself, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, women feel very similarly in many circles uh, for lots of reasons. Um, but I want to get to France Fanon, who, uh, first I want to know, why did we call him Fanon? And secondly, <laughs> <laughs> and, and also I thought it was a fascinating choice um, to uh, make around expressing the question, the fundamental question, which, you know, Africana Studies is very concerned with. What, is the, what are the options for response to systemic violence? Yeah. And to, you know, extreme constant forms of violence. And some of them are extreme in the way in which they're psychological, not necessarily just bodily harm, mm -hmm. um, you know, rape, assault, uh, you know, humiliation, degradation, um, and so on. Um, and so, you know, this, so, I mean, I, so I have 10 things I want to say and 10 things I want to ask. I mean, so the one thing I'll say is that, you know, I think, I hope people really got what that, how much that piece, that, that essay he wrote to embody Franz Fanon's argument about violence being a necessary response to violence, you know, both as a problem and as a reality, right? Because, um, you know, you can't always, 
you can try to model the nonviolent path, but that may not always work. And you have to be prepared to defend yourself in every way possible. So the tension between a Malcolm and a Martin, uh, you know, is is played out here. But, you know, so how did you come to this um, this assignment? Was it in the play? And if it, it, and then how do you think that attaches to, to the larger theme of, of the kind of violence of whiteness that I think you're, you're really pointing toward? Yeah. So I'll start with the first question as to why everybody called says Fannin. <laughs> you know, even as Harriet says in the story, she wasn't familiar with him. You know, I'm just, again, going back to my experience of being in suburban uh, Arlington, Virginia, and, you know, just the utter lack of awareness and knowledge that I had and that everybody around me had about black intellectual thought, about African intellectual thought, about Caribbean intele intellectual thought. Right. So, you know, these are people who are simply not exposed to any of this kind of thinking. So, you know, if, if they had started to pronounce it correctly as a, you know, sort of as a dramatic realistic choice, it would have sort of yeah. been a, a little odd, um, though they, you know, certainly would have the opportunity to go learn, but that's also part of the point, right? That yeah, yeah. jump to conclusions before actually going to properly investigate. And it was so interesting when we were traveling with the movie because, you know, often people would ask some of these kinds of questions, but would in the process jump to the same conclusions themselves <laughs> without actually taking a moment to check. And that's something I'm equally, we're all, we're all guilty of to a certain degree, that right. certainty and what we think is right and what we believe. Um, and Obviously, this is a story about perception and sometimes the limits of perception and the ways we are prisoners of our perception. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting thing to, to begin to explore and just the telling of the story. But particularly in terms of Fanon, um, in the play, the, 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 the paper he wrote was from a nondescript Eastern European uh, terrorist. So again, it was working in that kind of level of abstraction where it never quite specified what, what it was. And when I was adapting it, I felt Luce's journey would be much richer and deeper if what he was writing about was connected to the experience of how he has had to grapple with race in America right. as an African-American, because he's an African-American, and as an African, because he's mm -hmm. also an African, right? right. The multitudes that he um, uh, 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 inhabit uh, that are within him are are so rich, and it just immediately made me think of Fanon and the fact mm -hmm. that you have a man who grew up in Martinique and grew up with an expectation of the European white French ideal of what manhood was, and then he moves to France and sees the reality of what that is before going to Africa and Algeria and developing this revolutionary set of ideals, and then asking this question of, well, when is it enough? And, right. you know, the rage that you were talking about, right? The idea that at a certain point, that rage can kill you, can destroy you if it doesn't have a legitimate outlet when, when there's these injustices that are constantly pummeling you day in and day out. And obviously, you know, we had started to explore this before the words Black Lives Matter um, were uttered, but right. obviously those words were uttered and we started to see the protests that were happening then and the protests that we were happening now. It just, it felt like we were on the right track with the story. And for me, it felt like exploring Fanon was right because we're constantly grappling with this question, as you said, you know, whether it's Martin and, um, and Malcolm X or the moment now, when is it enough, right? If you choose the sort of benevolent resistance, the organized path of resistance well, you know, don't disturb us too much, right? You know, right. Just do it peacefully. And then if you utilize the kind of violent, but as you, as you said, not just violent, right? The dehumanization and the alienation that Fernandes talks about is psychological, it's spiritual. It's, it's so, there's so many different elements as to how we are being attacked. You know, it's the application of the law. Yep. At right. what point is action necessary to force people to pay attention? Right. Yeah. At no point in time in the history of this country has wide scale systemic change, whether it's the founding of the country or the repealing of slavery, had not had to resort to some form of violent resistance to change right. it. Yeah. So, you know, I was just very curious again about that question, because we, we have these ideals we've professed since Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and the way he's been turned into a symbol of this benevolent figure who, you know, is just sort of a Santa Claus at this point on some levels. <laughs> um, um, yeah. The reality of what he had to contend with and, you know, 
Right. God was assassinated. Right. And, 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 you know, nonviolence for him was a political strategy in the moment and in the context in which he was, was operating. Um, and, you know, that I think, you know, he's, he's a, you know, extremely well-educated, yeah. you know, philosophical thinker. And I'm sure he thought a lot about the consequences of violence um, because they're, they're real, but they're not necessarily avoidable, I guess, is, is, is the issue there. I'm going to ask just maybe one or two more quick questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, our uh, Jessica Dibble to check with our Q&A people, because I've talked way past our mm -hmm. time here, but it's been so incredible that um, I just decided to give professors I can you stick know. around a little longer too. I mean, yeah. it's such oh. a pleasure speaking with you. So oh, thank you. It's my pleasure entirely. Um, so, um, so just a couple things. So, you know, we're, we've talked a lot about, um, uh, you know, various moments where the film leaves you with your own sort of imagination that you fill it in. And, um, so one of the things that I was really acutely aware of is that I wanted to hear the details of his Eritrean, you know, war-torn story that was not told, right? Like I was waiting for his speech to basically explain that he was a child soldier and how many people he killed. And, you know, I mean, that's like the trope, right? Yeah. So can you tell me um, a little bit about that piece of the story, but also when you came here at 10 years old, did people assume that kind of history? I mean, you have a very distinguished family. You're not coming from a war-torn context like that. Um, but that doesn't mean people didn't basically come to this assumption. You're a kind of an immigrant, right? Who comes from somewhere in Africa, <laughs> you know, the country, the country called Africa, otherwise known as, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so was there any connection there for you in terms of what kinds of assumptions people drew? Absolutely. hundred percent. I mean, you know, I like loose while it might not be a one-to-one -one documentary reality, um, have, had my own particular moments and struggles and 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 challenges and you know when I first moved to Virginia for example I you know I didn't quite talk like this I lived around the world but I had an accent it was hard to place so they put me in an English as a second language course um uh <laughs> you know, I, um, um and um I pretty much failed through um sixth grade um uh it was taunting and jeering and laughing from students i mean you know it's oh my like, god and yeah it was pretty brutal and it that that first year um was a real struggle because of again the expectations of what they thought mm -hmm. being an african was you know it was everything from kids you know pretending to oh. shoot you know yeah literally anything you can imagine yeah you know, right every horrible ridiculous yeah, ignorant it, thing uh, you know so Man. um so again, it wasn't exactly the same as loose, but I had to deal with some of those stereotypes as well and then find a way to navigate them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at, at a certain point, you know, there was my family was distinguished to a certain degree. But then at another point when my father had left this country, my mom worked at McDonald's and and, you know, we lived in subsidized housing in Virginia and I got a, you know, a welfare Christmas present. Right. Um, and, uh, and my first year after university, I had experience as an undocumented immigrant in this country and mm -hmm. that had another, you know, Dimension. set of perceptions that were thrust on me. You know, mm. I would be working in a restaurant and somebody I knew from my life as a student would come in, right? Why are you working here? Why are you doing this? Da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, you want to be a filmmaker? So, yeah. Uh, but I was an immigrant, right? I was somebody who at that point didn't have wealth and didn't have privilege. And didn't and have standing, right? Didn't have standing yeah. and status. So having to negotiate all those different versions of a self, um, yeah. uh, something that I very acutely experienced from the age of 10 to, you mm. know, let's call it my early 30s. Um, so um, I very much so related to Luce in that way. There was another part to the question you asked, though. Um, I, I was so focused on what you were saying. I can't even, I think I, I was basically saying that, um, were there connections also with the assumption that you came from a war torn country, that you were, uh, you know, you know, one of the Sud Sudan boys or that you were, you know, like basically were the stereotypes of the chaos of the world outside of America, who's totally responsible usually for the chaos yeah. everywhere else is somehow separate, but that did those kind of war it narratives shape people's perception. Yes, but for me to a certain degree, yeah. And um, and and again, what was so 
you know, going back to Luce, what was so interesting about it was there, the, the fact that this kid, and there was a reason why, okay, this was the other part of the question, that we withheld that information in the school. Oh, right, right, exactly. You know, uh, it's funny, there was a point where we had flashbacks to his life in Eritrea. Oh. When we were writing. Huh. And um, as we were finishing the script, I pulled them all out. And that, again, went back to the question of perception, right? When you walk down the street and you see someone, all you have is the baggage that you place on them, Yep. right? The same as you said, as you just asked about in terms of how those kids were perceiving me, despite the fact I was coming at that time with a father who was the deputy ambassador to the United States, right? right. And then at a certain point, then I was the undocumented immigrant, again, despite the fact that right. I was educated and had gone to a good university. And then if you get pulled over, you're just a Negro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all so, that as a whole new framework. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, because it's, it's kind of a movie convention that you just explain away a character. And I just felt, you know, well, in the real world, when you're walking the street, I'm walking, anybody's walking down the street, we don't flash back to what their childhood was, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we just have what we see and then what we bring and have to make a set of assumptions of who we think that person is. Right. And I thought yeah. that element of perception was so critical to the story. I, that was smart. I, it, it really brought home you know, it, it gave another brick in the wall of, hey, you're bringing this, Trisha. You're bringing that, Trisha. You're bringing this, that, and the other. And of course, there were good things I brought, which was, you know, uh, some background with Franz Fanon. But <laughs> 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 otherwise, AKA for our listening audience, Fanon. <laughs> oh. um, but, you know, so you, we, it doesn't mean everything we bring is bad or everything we bring yeah. is an unsubstantiated stereotype. But, but it was amazing how much I wanted to know what Luce's experience really was from his perspective, but I also knew that I already had boxes filled up with things that yeah. um, that that he wasn't telling me, right? Therefore, they were my boxes. Um, and that's precisely what Harriet does in an effort to protect Luce and protect what she thinks Luce represents, right? right. So the notion that she's had this student who's a brilliant, brilliant student, brilliant athlete, you know, the dream of you know, what her mission is. And there was a reason why up on her wall, I had all the posters of Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King and Che Guevara. Sorry, right. uh, there's, a, um, uh, you know, all these different uh, people up there. Um, and despite what she, uh, uh, Cesar Chavez, that's what I was trying to, uh, yeah. despite all these people that, um, uh, 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 all these ideas she had of what he represented, right? She still could not, get past the bias, that fear, that unknowability of mm -hmm. well, maybe there's this small part of him that mm -hmm. has now wounded him. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Uh, that should, it was such a, it's still a scary idea to think about. But right. uh, I mean, I, even I, she who experiences the very same sets of stereotypes, we're, we're all subjected to them. So you were able to really, in a nuanced way, reveal the ways in which we're all in the same waters, but we're just not in the same boat. Right. You know, we're 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 all subjected to this uh, and, and there. But but it doesn't mean it's equal in terms of how how we can live with it. Yeah. Well, that's what was also interesting to me about the connection to Fanon and talking about postcolonial environments and talking about, you know, the, the the colonized intellectual, the person who starts to reinforce the the imposed imperial point of view sometimes strategically and sometimes unconsciously right because of what they are trying to achieve both on a personal level and and sometimes for their people so i, I thought that was again an interesting dynamic yeah and I calvin loose is a budding philosopher he's he's this kid who's got a lamborghini but no license to drive yeah he's got incredible intellectual horsepower but he's still forming himself. So he can read Fanon, right? He's, he's reading the kinds of things your average high schooler does not read. Right. Um, but in the process of trying to understand it and form himself, who is he going to be in the moment of the story? And that was what, you know, Calvin's job was mm -hmm. to try and navigate yeah all the complexities of, of, of who this young man was and what was unknowable about him as well. Exactly, right, right. What was so desirable about him and what was fundamentally unknowable. Wow, okay, well, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna get in trouble from my students if I don't let, <laughs> let us not uh, have me colonize every last question. But uh, So Jessica, I'm gonna pass the uh, mic over to you and I'll stay here for backup, but uh, you know, the, the floor is all yours to invite uh, our students into conversation. 
Thank you so much. This was an incredible, riveting conversation. I honestly could watch you guys go even longer, um, but I wanted to ask some of the Q&A questions. Um, firstly, we have one that asks, much of the film focuses on individuals imposing their ideas on loose of who they think he should be and how he should act. Um, can you talk about um, the idea of performativity in the movie as it relates to race? I know you touched on it, but I guess they asked if you could talk about it a little right. bit more. Talk about uh, the idea of what? Per performativity. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we were, uh, uh, again, this started with the play, but we were just very interested in the notion of who is expected to play a certain role um, to be acceptable, right? Um, you know, this is a bit of what uh, Dr. Rose and I were talking about, but, you know, it goes back to some of the notions of respectability politics as well that, you know, we're aware of in the African-American community of, of, of who you have to be and how you have to perform a certain identity um, to be rendered acceptable and then to have access to opportunities and to spaces and uh, uh, that can give you a sense of a future or a sense of possibility. And, um, uh, that tension is roiling underneath the surface for Luce and um, t also to all these other young people. You know, for me, it was very interesting that this was also a story about young people in terms of Deshaun and Stephanie and all these characters who are in the process of formation and having to come to understand what sort of performance they need to give of themselves to be acceptable. And again, that goes back to what Harriet says, we're all in boxes in America and some of us will get the light, some of us won't. So. As, as brutal as that idea is, it's not a misplaced idea, um, but it's also on some levels a heartbreaking idea when we think about the contract we're supposed to have as individuals with this country, um, uh, you know, for those of us who might not be a man or white. It's actually interesting too, because it's not just loose where you see this kind of difficult um, understanding of who they're who they are. Yeah, each character you kind of see it come out. Their challenges with trying to figure out who they are in this world, um, which actually leads nicely into this other question we have um, that says there's a push and pull between sincerity and deceit in the the character of Luce, um, and it can be tempting to doubt Luce's authenticity based on what we learn about him. So the question is, how did you handle the dissonance that we experienced throughout the film? Over the course of the story, we were very careful in the writing of it to make sure that Luce never tells a kind of a straight up explicit bald face lie, right? There's never a moment, you know, information might be with, but there's never a moment when he's like, this thing happened and you know it didn't happen, right? Um, even when it's down to, you know, the truth of what was happening with his locker, right? You see for a moment that somebody did stick their hand in and stick a book there. So at every point in time, we always wanted to be careful to leave the opportunity that what he was saying was truthful. And then also, if you think about the actual logic of what's going on in the story, is it really possible that this kid could have done everything that potentially happened in the film? So leaving those windows of opportunity were important. And then again, this was about that participatory component that I just felt was so important to the story because mm -hmm. we are watching this kid and having to make a decision as to, well, what do we believe and why do we believe it? And you know, if he was white, would we give him the benefit of the doubt? Right. Um, uh, what, 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 you know, what positive and negative connotations do we ascribe to him? And that's very much so the journey his mother is going through as well in the story and, and um, you know, both doubting herself, but then at certain times playing into her own preconceived notions of who she thinks her black son might be or what he's capable of. Mm -hmm. Actually very interesting. I feel like Luce always felt he wasn't really hurting anyone because he never told a lie until Harriet points out that he actually perpetuated Deshaun's stereotype. And I think that in that moment, he realized kind of the, the trauma he was kind of causing against everyone. Um, another question we have asked, were you ever worried that this film might reinforce the stereotype of black violence? You know, it's a question that I really grappled with, but again, going back to what the story is exploring, it's a question that also goes back to the audience. Why would you think that this one kid now is representative of entire race of people, right? Mm -hmm. This is one human being dealing with a very specific situation. So ultimately I wanted to trust that the audience could look at the context of this and then start to question what preconceptions they would have. I mean, again, if Luce was white, would we then assume that this is a story that is about, even though we are in a moment when you see what's happening in this country of mm -hmm. you know certain right-wing white male violence, is anybody raising their hand to, to 
to ask the question, well, now are all young white males violent, right? Yeah. So um, uh, ultimately, um, I know people can be susceptible to those preconceptions, but what I was interested in is, well, why are you susceptible to those preconceptions? Right. And, um, you know, how do you end up doing the exact same thing um, that often happens that, you know, when people profess the most positive liberal values, often it falls short of how they might perceive or treat people. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Another question we had um, explores more so Harriet's sister. Um, they ask if you could say more about Rose, Harriet's sister, her mental illness and the violence of the police in subduing her um, in that scene at the school. Um, well, uh, the sister is a high functioning schizophrenic and, you know, at certain points you hear the medication that she's on. And in that relationship, you know, it was important to understand some of where Harriet was coming from and why she believes what she believes. And, you know, as we were building this character and thinking, you know, working with Octavia as well of, you know, where she came from and Octavia, uh, Harriet is on some levels a version of Luce, and, and her sister is on some levels a version of Deshaun. And what we see happen in that scene is the way in which, whether it's policing or negative stereotypes, all these different um, assumptions that are made um, of blackness, and in this case, obviously it's a black woman who's um, uh, got mental health issues, can lead to a situation of the most extreme sort of violent reaction but it wasn't only just about that, it was also about the way the perception of Harriet shifts because she has a sister like that, mm -hmm. right? And what that exposes about her um, within the community of the school and how then it starts to shift the parents' experience, um, perception of her or the principal's perception of her. So um, uh, the story was um, uh, about, and the relationship was illuminating Harriet and just illuminating the reality of what kind of complex situation she might be coming from as well and hopefully doing it in a way that felt authentic and respectful. You know, the thing I've always said to everybody who asks about this movie, I've never viewed a depiction as an endorsement and I've never viewed, you know, trying to be honest about at least the world I've seen and experienced and everything that's hap that happens in the story. They're all versions of things, um, even some of the things that, um, you know, were already originally part of the play um, that I felt a firsthand experience with. And, um, felt like the story only works if it's being as honest as possible and depicting how power and privilege in those situations tend to manifest themselves. Um, and that also contributes to the ending of the story and why, you know, uh, what Dr. Rose was saying before about what might feel unresolved, you know, a big part of how white privilege and power operates is the having the privilege and power to erase and negate what has happened, mm -hmm. right? So by the end of the right. story, Amy is simply able to say, well, you know what, that's done. Mm -hmm. I got my boy, whatever happens to Harry, whatever happens to her sister, that's that's thrown away. We're, we're, we're gonna have, you know, possibly have our, our nice future. Um, um, and that to me felt like the truest, uh, at least within this story, resolving of it. So every component of what was happening in the film was how could we be as truthful and honest to the, you know, the experiences of these characters and often how um, power and privilege uh, has played out in the world. Yeah, I felt, I remember when Harry sort of running down the hallway to go to the front of the school, I thought, I just immediately knew this was going to be used against her character. And you see it when Pete watches it after Lucy's showing the video, like his whole perception and, yeah. and view of Harry changes in that moment, which is very interesting. Um, which kind of leaves, we only have a couple more questions. I don't want to go too long. Mm -hmm. But um, another question we had, um, asked if you could talk a little bit more about Pete's character, um, like the violent white patriarchal male, and he might be seemingly misogynist uh, with this comment with the, uh, when people say stern, they mean, um, and um, Kate says that she, she found him to be so threatening, scary, and would like to know a bit more about his character. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, we again just wanted to be as honest as possible in the rendering of these characters. And, you know, what was interesting about Peter is he's also one of those people who thinks he gets it. He thinks he knows, right? He thinks he knows how, you know, uh, uh, the world works and, you know, the truth of liberal values and the ways that, and his self-awareness or the self-awareness he thinks he has means then he's not susceptible into, uh, to the kinds of biases that we see presented in the film and, and, you know, both the way he treats Luce at a certain point and 
how quick he is to potentially decide that his son might be guilty or the way he reacts to Harriet. And, you know, I mean, he's threatened by her, but he, he, he tries to make it a joke. He tries to, you know, now I'm hit by, I get it. And, you know, that's just the way people are and da, 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 da. So he was a version of this person that we felt like we'd seen and met and, you know, that I felt that I'd seen, I'd met in Arlington who, um, yeah, okay, he's adopted the black son. And, you know, on the surface, from the performative standpoint of it, him and Amy have done the right thing and brought this kid into a world where um, uh, he's now going to have a chance for a future that he might not have otherwise. But how much does he actually believe it? How much was he doing it just to keep his wife happy? And at what point, you know, is he just sort of over it? Which I think we get a sense of that in in the story. So, um, uh you know, the, the movie is a little bit more primarily about the triangle of Harriet and Amy and Luce, but right. it was important to us as well to, to have this father figure and, you know, sort of thought through how he was viewing this, um, even though it was somewhat tangential to the story, but it was still important in terms of the role he's playing in Luce's life. And then when you think about who he is as a figure in Luce's life, and then you think about who Amy is as a figure in Luce's life, hopefully you start to understand a little bit more why this kid is so conflicted and what he doesn't have access to that he might've had if he had perhaps a black parent or mm -hmm. figure in his life who could give him a kind of understanding and nurturing that they can't, no matter how well-meaning their values were. So, you know, when we were, again, rehearsing, I would always say to Naomi and Octavia, Luce has two mothers, and they both have things they can offer him and things that they can't offer him. And part of the conflict of this movie is that. And on some levels, Peter is standing outside of that and, of course, then feels emasculated to a certain degree as well in his standing outside of that, which... Um, I think manifests itself in some of the aggression. And I think that was also just a really smart choice, um, uh, Tim, because we talked about that, the kind of energy he would give off. So um, it, it was deliberate to make him a little bit more off edged. Definitely. And I wanna ask one last question. Um, and it's actually another, <laughs> regarding another character in the film. Um, they ask, was there any specific reason that Stephanie Kim is Asian? What is the role that her Asian identity plays in this film? Well, that started in the play and, you know, JC who wrote the play is um, uh, part Asian, part black, part white, multiple different identities. And, you know, that's actually a big question. Yeah, <laughs> and, it is. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a part of it that I'll, let me just put this to the side, but there's a part of it where as a writer for JC is for me as a writer, director, we're always just thinking, can we create interesting, complex roles for people of color? And the idea of being able to write this role for, for, for you know, when it started as a play for an Asian actress to come in and have a really amazing scene was something that was important to JC and important to me as well when we were putting together the film. But then um, there's also, you know, going back to what Trisha said about uh, sort of a immigrant model minority figure and, and, you know, the model Asian, the model black student, there's all these archetypes that you're expected to live up to um, as a person of color in this country. And, you know, there's preconceived notions of who people might also think Stephanie is and what they might think she's capable of and how much autonomy they might think she might want to have in exercising her sense of identity. Right. So in um, exploring that, it felt like it was, again, another opportunity in terms of sort of looking at the generational aspect in the story to bring in a number of different perspectives, um, whether it's an African immigrant, whether it's an Asian American girl, and see how they're all contending with identity. And then also in terms of the interaction that happens between Luce and Stephanie and the Kim in the story, if, if Stephanie was white in the story, it becomes a completely different movie. Um, on some levels, that's especially so true. <laughs> Very assault, which is not to say that's the only reason that decision was made. But we were always thinking about the complexity of how these interactions would operate, um, um, and you know, ultimately it came down to who is the most interesting person that feels like they should be a part of the fabric of the story. And as I said, when I was adapting it for the film, every single one of these characters was a version of somebody I knew. And there was somebody just like a Stephanie Kim. As I said, you know, one of the two Asian American girls in the IB classes I took, I patterned the character off of her. 
Um, uh, so I, I was always just trying to be authentic, but then think about the implications of who these people are and the struggles that they would be going through. So, you know, whether it's Luce, whether it's Deshaun, whether it's Stephanie, um, I felt they were all young people who get put in very specific kind of boxes. And the tension of this movie is partially how they try to break out of those. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is truly amazing. And I, I wanted to say thank you again so much for participating. And thank you, Professor Rose, for moderating and leading this discussion. It was truly fascinating. And I wish I had more time, but I don't want to kind of go even longer. Um, Thank you again so much. Um, we really, really appreciate having you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Rose. This was such a pleasure. It was thank my pleasure. I hope we, I, I'm sending you my info in the chat so we can mm -hmm. stay in touch. It, it was fantastic. And, you know, this is the kind of work that has a huge impact. You know, it's not one thing that changes everything, but it's a, it's a, a slow drip of, of brilliant interventions. I mean, no one can see this film and not be left with, questions that are both very difficult to answer, but require an activated new self, right? A kind of, a, a way of being that is unfamiliar. And hopefully in that process, we, we get out of these boxes that we've put ourselves or put others in. So we're really grateful to you. Thank you so much, Julius. It was so great to meet you again. <laughs> I will not forget this one, I guarantee. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Thank you. Great to meet you. Everybody. Thank you, Jessica, and the whole team. Thank you so much.